Welcome to the Intelligence Briefing Live What's the Buzz, where leaders and hands-on experts share how they have turned hype into outcome. Today, we'll talk about automating your job with generative AI. And who better to talk to about it than someone who's doing just that? Eric Fraser. Hey, Eric, thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Andreas. It's great to be here. Awesome. Hey, Eric, um, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, who you are, and what you do? Yes, thanks. So I'm currently the Executive Vice President of Revenue Operations and Technology at a consulting company with about 100 people in it. Um, and I'm also currently playing the role of sales manager. And that's the role that I went to my boss and said, hey, I bet I could get an AI to do this whole thing. But I was wrong, by the way. But that's what I, I started off with as a premise and a hypothesis. And my boss, because he's really supportive, he said, well, I bet you can't, but I love the curiosity and I want to see what you can do. So go for it. That's awesome. I'm, I'm going to say I'm super excited to hear more about you and, and your journey. Um, I know we've been connected for quite some time, actually, over, over LinkedIn. So, um, so I was really intrigued when I saw your post a couple of weeks ago that that's what you're doing. And so I uh, wanted to in invite you to the show and um, also for, for you to share with the rest of the audience what you're seeing, what is actually realistic and where maybe some um, yeah. some roadblocks that, that you're hitting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, overall, the reason that I was wrong and that I can't just automate my entire job with AI is that the role of sales manager has too much human to human nuance and connection that's needed to be really good at it, both conversations inside the company and conversations with prospects and customers. And I haven't found a generative AI like, you know, the, the type that you see, you know, when you use chat GPT, I haven't found one of those that's just good enough at being a sales manager. So this is a challenge with the current large language models like chat GPT is that they are broad, but they are somewhat shallow. So you can ask ChatGPT about a huge number of things, but when you start getting really focused on, well, what should I do about this deal though? Should I increase the price? Should I reduce the price? Should I offer some sort of incentive? That's where it starts to become not so smart and not so helpful. So we don't have any large language models that are specifically for sales management. Although I do think that some of them are being built by some of the large CRM vendors, right. but they're just not there yet. And they're not, stable enough, they're not deep enough for my boss and, and my CFO to be happy talking to them instead of me. So if I said to my CFO, hey, you know, take these questions and ask them to this large language model here, he would be incredibly frustrated. He'd say, look, I tried that and it just gave me some really dumb answers. I want to talk to you. You give me these answers. Awesome. Um, I know we have a few questions lined up. Um... And um, maybe a quick question to, to the audience. We've already jumped in, in into the topic, so I'm, I'm glad you, um, you're providing some context here. But for those of you in, in the audience, I'm really curious where you're joining us from today. I already see in, in the chat folks joining from India, from Austria, from Nigeria, from Greece, Cameroon. I'm, I'm always blown away seeing um, how, how far, you know, in, in, in which parts of, of the world um, people are, are watching What's the Buzz. So, Please let us know where you're joining from. Super excited to have all of you with us today. I love the global nature of your audiences. I've, I've been in the audience several times, and I really like the range that we can reach here. Yeah, so that's fantastic. Um, hey, Eric, to, to stay with the theme, should we play a little game to kick things off? What do you let's think? do it, absolutely. All right, so let's, let's do this. Um, so this game is called In Your Own Words. Um, when I hit the buzzer, the wheels will start spinning. And when they stop, you'll see a sentence. And I'd like for you to complete that sentence with, with the first thing that comes to mind and why, in your own words. To make Great. it a little more interesting, you'll only have 60 seconds for your answer. So Sounds are you good. ready for what's the buzz? I'm ready. Okay. Oops. And... This is life, right? So, absolutely. Hiccups are expected. So, there you go. If AI were a bird, what would it be? Okay. I think if AI were a bird, it would be a condor, an Andean condor. And the reason that bird comes to mind 
is because they fly at extremely high altitudes and so they can see a broader set of the world um, than birds who fly at a lower altitude. And I think that's the potentiality of AI is that it can um, it can see a perspective that the human brain or a single human brain would find very difficult to accumulate um, just because of the, the biological constraints of a human brain. That's awesome. Um, I, I haven't heard Condor yet as an answer, so that's fantastic. We have people mention uh, Phoenix rising from the ashes, um, the, the majestic nature of, a, uh, of eagles, now Condor with the, the, the high altitude view. That's, that's amazing. Um, so maybe from high altitude to our topic, um, you've, you've already mentioned a few things where you're, you're seeing some of the uh, limitations. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you, you said, hey, I'm, I, I want to consciously and purposefully see how far I can push the boundaries of yes. automating my sales manager role. And I know people are, are usually afraid of losing their job, especially to a machine. So why would you actively try to automate your job? Sure. Well, first of all, I have to acknowledge that um, I work in a culture where I don't have to be necessarily afraid. Um, if I find a way to automate something that I do, no one's going to come and say, oh, well, you know, you're fired. Um, so I have that privilege uh, and I'll acknowledge that. But also even more broadly, um, frankly, there are just some parts of my role that are not full of joy. I mean, some of the traditional sales manager role is pulling numbers out of software, putting them in a spreadsheet, doing a bunch of spreadsheeting, and then sending that spreadsheet to several other people. Um, I personally don't get a lot of joy out of doing that. And that is absolutely AIable, not with chat GPT, not with Bard, not with Claude, but with more old fashioned AI. And that's what I was able to do. I was able to take a lot of the number crunching and number pulling and pushing aspects of my job and just AI it and just, you know, either shrink it or zero it. That's that's an interesting perspective, right? I, I think there's a lot of promise of, of what you can do or what you're supposed to, to be able to, to do, but really putting it to the test and, and seeing what is what is real um, yeah. is, is, is great. So for those of the in, in the audience, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Eric, feel free to put it in, in the chat and we'll take a look in a minute or, or two and uh, take some of the questions here as well. Now, you said some of the, the number crunching, right, and, and uh, analysis is, is what you've been focusing on and, and seeing some success for, for sales management. I'm wondering what, what other tasks are, are you seeing that, that you're able to automate or that you're not able to automate? And maybe you've already alluded to it in yeah. the beginning. So, so there's a part of it um, that I'll just generally call pattern recognition. Um, and this is about 75% AI-able in my, I mean, I'm sticking a very broad number on there, but pattern recognition in sales management is looking at what's happening to your deals and understanding broad patterns like, oh, if we don't get a CFO from the buyer's side involved by at least stage three, we're always going to get problems with pricing and discounting in stage four. So that's a pattern that if you are paying attention to your deals, you will probably see it as a human but an AI will see those patterns faster than you and maybe better than you. Maybe it'll see some patterns that you don't even see, regardless of how much you're paying attention, because AIs are way better at reading numbers than humans are. So um, if you've got good data um, or you're able to capture good data, then you can trust an AI to show you patterns that you would have taken a lot longer to find yourself or that maybe you would never have found. Now, the reason it can't be 100% delegated to the AI is because there's still some human interpretation of the pattern. So let's say the AI tells you, oh, when you sell to this industry, you always single thread yourself, meaning you don't talk to enough people in the account. You only talk to, I don't know, like the chief nursing officer or something of a hospital instead of the CFO and the president. Um, so it might tell you that that pattern exists, but what do you do about it? So usually there's a smart human that has that answer. AIs right now, don't yet have a great answer for what to do about single threading on large accounts. So you mentioned something about data, right? If, if you have data, if, if you have good data, if you have clean data, I think if you're in, in the space of AI or, or data itself, you know that that's hardly ever the case, right? That's, that's what we all wish for and, and dream about. But yeah. how do you go about getting data and, and getting data that, that is useful for, for the purpose that you need it for? Yeah, this was one of the early 
um, points of challenge for me. Like when I realized how incomplete our CRM data was, and I don't think we're particularly bad. I think we're kind of average as far as CRM users go. I looked at it and I compared it to reality and I thought, this is not a high fidelity picture of reality. This, this is probably not going to work. But what I was really impressed by is if you take certain AI tools and, and ask them to collect data, you can fill in the gaps of the picture in very surprising ways. So this is where at first I got discouraged early on and then I got super encouraged when I just pushed the boundaries a little bit and asked the AI to do a little bit more. Like, well, see if you can fill in the, you know, interpolate the picture for me. Um, and it just really was a lot better than I thought. So even people on this thread who might be thinking, oh, our CRM data is terrible. This will never work for us. There are technologies available now that, will make your data a little better than than you think. Um, that That is a deep topic that we could do a whole other call on. But just as a general thing, I'd say I was also discouraged and then I got encouraged when I just pushed a little further. I see. Um, one of the questions that I see here in, in, in the chat from Justin uh, is, do you find the efficiency scheme to be worth the learning curve of experimenting with and learning how to use the tools? I think that's a really good yeah. one. Absolutely. So my personal situation is that I like learning about AI. Now, if you don't like learning about AI, like if you find math really horrible, it may not be worth the squeeze, right? I actually enjoy it. So, um, you know, sometimes in my spare time, I just like listening to, you know, podcasts about AI math. Um, so maybe I'm a little unusual in that respect, but um, the it's not just the efficiencies of what I don't have to do anymore. It's all of the ways, it has this kind of um, unforeseen benefits effect. So it's like the space program where they, they discover something and at first they think, well, that's a nice discovery. We have no idea how this is going to be useful. But then a year later, they realize, oh my goodness, we just totally transformed laser technology and suddenly it's used everywhere and all over the world. So there's a little bit of that to it as well, where at first you think, oh, I'm going to save myself one hour of spreadsheeting, but then it turns into something way bigger than that. Awesome. Um, I think that's 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 especially interesting. Uh, interesting like I said, if, if you're curious and, and you like to uh, tinker around with it anyways and, and see what's available, how can you make it part of your role and um, also see for yourself maybe what are some things that, that you haven't considered yet, but that are new tools that, that are available and, and so on. Um, let me let me take a look here. Um, I think that there's another question here. Somebody was asking, well, with, um, or, or Savant was asking, with OpenAI now recently releasing ChatGPT for, for enterprise, Mm. How do you see something like that either influence your role as a sales manager or, or the roles of uh, sales managers in, in general? Directionally, it's going to have a huge influence. So first of all, the the three things that it solved when it, the big things, uh, you know, security, privacy, um, and encryption, um, privacy meaning you don't necessarily have to give your data to open AI now for it to train its models. That will just result in a much broader adoption of these types of tools. So now that they've done it, everyone's going to have to meet that standard. And so you'll have this opt-in, you know, standard where, look, I choose to give you my data or maybe I don't, and companies want that choice. So that'll result in a much broader adoption within enterprises. But also where it's going is the, the business use, not just the consumer use, but the business use of generative AI. And so you also have, in the same thread of direction, you also have... Um, where McKinsey recently paid a, a company to make a McKinsey specific large language model. Um, and that, that sort of effort is going to result in um, roles like mine uh, being transformed. Because if you start to have large language models that are very specific in a particular area, like let's say you have um, a large language model that is uh, really good at diagnosing the types of ailments that people go to their family GP about, um, you know, then you can start to also make a large language model that's good at sales management. So there will be this development curve where, um, you know, steps like releasing enterprise versions of chat GPT and, and what McKinsey did, they will push us towards a world where the large language models get better and better at the things we ask them to get better at. 
I really like where you're going with this, right? And that there is a journey, there's a trajectory where we're starting at, at one point right now, right? And there, there's a lot of manual work still in, in, involved in either doing your prompt engineering, doing your fine tuning, uh, adjusting it to, to what you need, connecting it to data sources and, and so on. And right. I, I believe too, right? Over the, over the next couple quarters, I think we were talking about this earlier, maybe the next year or, or two, we'll, we'll see this mature even further and become more and more user-friendly. I think yeah. that's, that's where it gets really exciting, right? It is. And I think there's also this element where right now, there's a lot of human effort needed to train a large language model. But people have already started to think, well, what if we could get AI to train AI? So people who are interested in that should check out uh, a company called Anthropic. And so they've started to tinker with the, I'm not really tinker. I mean, they're way further than the tinkering stage, but they have um, a design where you can refine and improve the training data set, which is the data set that trains a large language model by using AI. Um, so I would check that out. And that's also, I think, a direction that AI is going is that we'll try to reduce the uh, the human the low level human energy that's needed to train data sets in other words you know you don't have like warehouses full of people in a third world country furiously tagging images saying that's a dog that's a cat that's a car you know we'll get rid of that at some point and that's not good work by the way we don't want a bunch of humans having to do that I think there was in, in, in the news earlier this year by Time Magazine and, and, and others. So definitely um, also the, the toll that it takes on, on mental health and, and people right. is something right. where if there's more automation and, and quality, right, that, that can be um, addressed differently. Right. Now, we've we've talked about journey, right, and we're uh, at, at the beginning still, obviously at an, an inflection point of using generative AI, and AI as a whole and where this might go. But talk about journey. Um, what's been your journey like so far? Uh, in addition to you know keeping an open mind and, and seeing what else is is available, what can you use? How have you gone about it? Yeah. Well, um, other than the fact that I found out I was wrong and that I couldn't AI my entire job, but I could AI parts of it. The other big lesson um, that was a bit what well, was humbling for me was to realize that I had completely underestimated the the cultural or the human experience effect of introducing even a little bit of AI into the company. So when I started introducing little bits of AI, I thought, well, I'm only really doing this for my team, the revenue team. So other teams in the company won't care. But in fact, what happened was they did care a lot and some of them were alarmed, right? They thought, what are you doing over there? I mean, are you trying to get rid of our jobs? And so it was a, luckily it was fairly quick for me to adjust to that because we only have a small you know, number of people in our company. But I was thinking if I was doing this in a 20,000 person company, the ripple effect of that concern might get quite serious and hard to undo. So the lesson that I took is if I ever was, uh, you know, doing this in a larger company, I'd start with some reassuring communication, clarifying, this is exactly what I'm doing. And this is why I'm doing it. And here's what it will probably do. And here's what it certainly won't do. And just being communicative, I think, is super important when you do introductions of AI. Uh, people are concerned about things like, you know, will AI take my job? So if you don't say anything, they tend to assume the worst. So we had people in finance, you know, concerned about something that I thought, oh, why are they concerned? This has nothing to do with them. Well, they were concerned because I missed the step where I was supposed to communicate to everyone, here's what I'm doing and why. I think that's a great point. And if I think back to, to previous roles in, in, in my career, especially in, in IT, where we're going through some outsourcing, there were similar concerns, right? Even even if management assured you nothing is going to happen, right? We're, we're outsourcing parts of, of the, the roles um, to, to a different provider, but that gives you more time to, to work on other things. In, in a similar way, right? If we're now having this conversation about AI, I can also um, clearly see that, that there is concern, right? And does management just tell us you know, that's, that's what they're doing. Are, are they really doing it? So I think that the part around trust and obviously having a, a, a trusted relationship and, and culture to begin with, and then to your point to communicate openly and transparently and, and also show that, uh, that you're for real, right? Through the actions that, that you right. take, it, that, that's very important. Right, um, right. And if you're trying to do it for efficiency, for example, like if you're introducing AI because you think, oh, I can save a million dollars by removing some labor cost. Well, also consider that if you create the wrong experience for a bunch of people, 
those experiences might lead to negative beliefs about the company and or their roles in it. And that will definitely affect their behaviors. And those behaviors might start to produce results that completely wipe out the savings that you were trying to get to. True. Um, I see a question here from, from Fred in, in the chat. Have you actually created that communication now to continue your exploration and journey or maybe to phrase it a little differently? How have you ad adapted your approach and your communication since you've learned about that? Yeah, so I've spoken to the teams in particular. So in our organization, it's important to speak to the teams. Um, I can also speak to them, you know, at, at a company-wide level, but it's more effective in our organization if I go to one team and say, okay, so here's what I'm doing. It's just for the revenue team, but here's the effect it's going to have on the revenue team. Even if I'm describing things that don't even touch their their lives at work, it's reassuring to them to hear, oh, that's what they're doing over there. Right, got it. Oh, and that's why they're doing it. Okay. And it just, it's a better experience for them than just to know that something's going on over there with AI and I have no idea what it is. So I'm, I'm curious, building on, on, on that, right? I, I hear um, a lot of leaders in, in, in the AI space also talking about creating FOMO, right? uh, fear of missing out. So if, if you're doing this with AI in, in your uh, revenue operations role, what about your peers? How, how are they viewing it? Are you indirectly creating some FOMO and they're saying, oh, Eric is uh, um, becoming so much more efficient and, and effective because of using AI. I, I want to do the same thing. And, and are they coming to you and asking you, how, how are you doing this? And what can I do in my role? Um, yes, they are coming to me. And to be honest, I hadn't adequately thought about the FOMO effect. This is a just a general challenge that I have as a professional. <laughs> and sometimes I'm just not, aware enough of um, the experiences that some of the decisions I take create for people who I think, oh, they don't need to worry about that. They're not even on my team. Mm -hmm. But I have to keep reminding myself, no, no, no. When they hear about this sort of stuff, they will have an experience and I need to be conscious of that experience. So maybe there is more FOMO than I realize. But what I'm experiencing myself is that people do come to me and say, show me that tool again. What does that do? Could we use that? And so I remain open to everyone in my company to answer questions about it. A lot of the time, the answer is, no, that's probably not that relevant for you. But here's a tool that might be, right? So we have a legal and contracts team, for example, that have not yet come to me and asked me about, can I use ChatGPT to do legal drafting? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm going to have a lot of warnings for them if they ask me that. But I'd be happy to show them, like, well, yes and no. You know, I mean, you could probably get it to do some simple things, but be super careful because especially in the area of law, it's actually done some screwy stuff. Yes, we've we've seen that just a couple of months ago in in the news, right? When right. Um, right. when users uh, attribute more capabilities to the AI than than it yeah. can actually de deliver, or if, if they're not yeah. aware of, of of all the the boundary conditions and, and limitations. Right. Um, but I'm I'm curious in in general, what's your recommendation? How can leaders in, in different parts of, of the business actually embrace the AI driven change and, and do that responsibly? Yeah, I would start with the discipline of writing down what you get asked to do and just humanly observe the patterns of what people ask you to do all the time. So when you notice that, you know, several times a day you get asked the question, let's say in a sales management role, like, okay, so what are the 10 largest deals that we absolutely can guarantee are going to come in? Of course, no deal is guaranteed, but you get asked this question a lot, like what can we absolutely rely on that will come in this quarter? So if you get asked that question all the time, well, there's a good candidate for applying some sort of AI or some other sort of automation. Um, and you could save yourself some time and improve the answer. So I would start with just becoming aware of what is it that you're being asked to do. Get fairly disciplined about, you know, being aware of what, how much time do you spend on certain things and where are the patterns and where would you like to spend less time? Like I would like to spend less time spreadsheeting, for example. Um, what do you get asked all the time? Well, I get asked all the time about what's, you know, reliably, what can we rely on to come in in a quarter? Um, and how can you maybe improve an answer that you think is a bit soft? Like sometimes I tell people, I think we can reliably rely on these deals. And myself, I'm thinking, you know, one of those deals, I'm not even sure of myself. So... You know, I think there's a candidate where if I apply some AI to look at the signals that are happening in that deal, maybe the AI can say, oh, you're dreaming, man. Like that is not going to come in. That's awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that, Eric. 
Um, now we're getting close to the end of the show. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can summarize the three key takeaways for our audience today. And I think it's especially if, if you can focus on automating your job, is it fact, is it fiction? Um, what, what are the, the three key takeaways today? Yeah, I would say um, in my job, it's, it's greatly fact, but I had overestimated. I was over optimistic about how much of it could be automated. Um, I would say be careful of the hype around generative AI um, and look for ways to use older and less fashionable um, types of AI. There are some uh, elements of machine learning, for example, that are not generative AI, but are super useful in lots and lots of professional roles. So I would look in the vault of older AI and pick through that and see if that can help you um, just because generative AI can't do it yet doesn't mean that there isn't some other AI that could do it really well. Uh, and the third one, and, and maybe the most important, the one that I got the most wrong, is just to be more aware of the human impact and the experiences that you are creating when you decide to use AI to do anything. Even if you think, oh, no one else will care about this. This is just for me. No, I guarantee you someone's caring about it. And you need to reach that person and create the right experiences for them. Awesome. Thank you for, for sharing. I think especially that, that last part around um, being being conscious or, or becoming more conscious of the, the communication and, and the impact on, on others as you're embarking on this definitely sounds like it's a, it's a project and an exploration um, worth spending time on and, and seeing how far you can actually push the boundaries. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and one, one comment that I, I do want to, to pick up before we wrap up, uh, Martin says basically, hey, Maybe you don't even need AI. Maybe something like robotic process automation can do the trick for for some of the things as well. So, I think so. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that actually, that's one of the older types of AI um, that I think is worth looking at. So, there's lots of different types of AI that is that are not generative AI. I would absolutely check them out. Right. Um, yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us um, and for sharing your expertise with us, Eric. Really appreciate having you on the show and hearing your experience. Happy to be here. And it was a pleasure. Thanks Fantastic. very much. For us. Thanks, everybody in the audience for learning with us and see you next time for another round of the Intelligence Briefing Live. What's the buzz? Bye-bye. Cheers, everyone.